And all the people said amen. amen. Praises be to our God who is indeed worthy of our presence and our praise and our participation on his agenda. Honorable Pastor Dr. Walker Amen. and uh, to all of these preachers and Amen. pastors here tonight, yes. to the wonderful workers and warriors and worshipers of the Cherry Grove family, those who are sharing as guests tonight from wherever you're from, my brothers and sisters, how sweet it is to be a child of God and to have been extended the opportunity to come together again in this sacred space under the auspices of revival uh, says that God is still merciful and gracious and loving and kind and understanding and still willing to put up with our mess. I want to say publicly and personally thank you to this pastor for the um, honorable invitation to come and to share with you and the Cherry Grove family in this series of revival services. And um, I trust that um, something has been said to be of inspiration to each of you here at some point since we first met. I want to um, commend your following this young visionary in your pastor who is serious, who is sincere, and who means you no harm, and wants only good for you, that in the person of your pastor, the right Reverend Morrick Walker. Amen. I, I thought you could do better than that. I've told you before, and I don't mind telling you again, Doc Jackson, nowhere in the Bible where you ever read where God sent a church to a preacher. But you have read where he has sent a preacher to a church. And the Lord has blessed you with a faithful gift. Don't take it for granted. And uh, he already knows that uh, he has been assigned to a great people. And the church is moving upward and onward, and that's not to insult your former pastors, all members, all predecessors. We're all standing on their shoulders. Amen. 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 And we thank you, Cherry Grove, for your warm welcome, reception, and generosity, and always your unique spirit of worship. Now, and I'm going to get on to try to preach because you all got to get over to Vicksburg and these places. Preacher, preacher, preacher. I, I thank God for all these preachers. My brother, yeah. here tonight. Dr. Alfonso Lewis and some of these brothers here for all the way from Memphis. Yeah. Brother here tonight from Kentucky. Amen. Yes, sir. And then, of course, my own family is here. But above all, my mother-in-law is here tonight. And amen. Stand up, Mamie. If y'all bother her now, I'll fight somebody. <laughs> amen. Show her some love. Amen. 
sweet, sweet spirit, and we thank God for her. Look at the person sitting next to you and see if you can make them smile. <laughs> Don't look up in there, just, just make them smile. Tell them you better smile. God bless your hearts. Give God some praise, if you will. God, our Father, thank you now for another day. Thank you for sparing us and bringing us under this point in time. Thank you for allowing our coming to this appointed place. Forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. And please accept our prayers and our praise. We need to hear from heaven now. Speak, Lord, in this place. Your people are listening. Give me your word and what it takes to deliver it. Touch my spirit that I may be in tune with you. And touch this house for your glory. We dare not gather for show. We came to celebrate you. Granted, Lord, this is your servant's prayer. I pray in the strong and saving name of Jesus, the people of God, said amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, come with me to the book of 2 Kings, the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. The book of our uh, second Kings, the sixth chapter, while you are searching, I thank God for my, I have two brothers here tonight, my oldest son, nephews and nieces, an adopted sister here, I don't know where, where Miss Butler is, but thank God for you all and for my sister-in-law, sister-in-laws who are my sisters. Thank God for family. Yeah, yeah. Once you shall have found that passage and read it there, you may see these words as I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. Lord, help. And he answered, Go. Mm. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Look at you. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? Fall off. When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Lean over and tell the person closest to you, go back and get it. Give God some praise for what he's getting ready to tell you. Go back and get it. You will never enjoy the sweet taste of victory if you're always quitting. Help me, help me. 
you never see how glorious God can be in your life if you give up so soon. And you will always taste the agony of defeat. You will never raise a trophy. You will never be hailed as a victor. And success will never be a part of your resume. If you have a spirit that's forever surrendering to circumstance. You'll never get a chance to celebrate and praise with others who are champions of great cause if your personality is privy and packed with, with, with a drive or a lack thereof. Yes, sir. You will never see what it looks like yes, sir. to enjoy how God can shower upon you yeah. oh, no. festive and fiesta and parade yes, sir. if you are subject yeah, 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 yeah. to quitting. I was trying to find another word. But the world would not be where it is and what it is today. Yes, sir. Had it not be, and if it had it not been, and were it not for people who had resolve and resilience and who always exhibited a never back down disposition. The late Coach Weeb Eubanks put it this way, Dr. Walker, quitters never win. And winners never quit. Quitters don't build pyramids in Egypt without tractors and pulleys, which still defies the law of science and logic and has have lasted for thousands of years. Quitters don't, don't defeat British imperialism yeah. in Middle East India yeah. no, no. with a pair of wire rim glasses, yeah. a pair of sandals and a bamboo stick yeah. and gives to the world its first example of civil disobedience. Yeah. Yes, Quitters don't defeat apartheid in South Africa and spend 27 years of their life in prison and then move from a prison cell to the office of presidency of the same nation that put them in prison. Quitters don't win and winners don't quit. Quitters don't break the color barrier in the White House in America. Quitters, quitters never win. And winners never quit. Yes, sir. But I contend, beloved, there are some things that can happen to you that will make you want to quit. Especially when you know you're in and involved in an endeavor. And you have become a part of a certain kind of association and you don't have to be that. You have the tendency to entertain the thought, I don't have to take this. I don't have to do this anymore. Because there's something that will come along that will make you want to quit. You raise your child in the fear and admonition of God and no sooner than they assume some adolescent responsibility they take up the lifestyle of Pookie and Ray Ray. It makes you want to quit. You send your child to school to learn from the teacher. They come back molested by the teacher. You, you go to church seeking serenity among the saints. You leave there wounded by a saint. Some things can happen that makes you want to quit. 
you go to the poll and you cast your vote and you end up learning that the, that the election has been hijacked and it makes you say to yourself why do I have to put up with this why do I keep going through with this when you don't have to but if you're really determined to reach your goal if you're really determined to see your dreams come true and your hopes come to fruition there is something within your disposition and spirit that says I won't back down I won't throw in the towel I won't wave the white flag I won't do a Marvin Gaye I won't holler and throw up both my hand and whatever it is that has come my way I'm either going through it I'm going around it I'm going over it and if I lose it I'm determined to get it all back so Mr. Church person and Mrs. Church lady you can't fool me I know too much about life I've been knocked about too much I've been through too much hell I've, I've caught too much trouble to believe that life for you is just so pristine and pleasant and peaceful and palatable and couchy and kosher and comfortable and congenial and preferable you've been catching hell too you've been down in the dumps too you've gotten behind the eight ball too you've been in debt too your heart has been broken too you have your spirit has been wounded too hell has gotten into your house just like everybody else and hell hounds have been on your trail just like everybody else don't try to sit up in here and fool everybody else you wish the enemy would get off your back too and you've entertained the thought from time to time forget this especially when the enemy has imposed upon your predicament and caused you to lose what you had but I'm a living witness tonight you can get it back you didn't hear me did you in the hit movie how Stella got a groove back. Terry McMillan, the award-winning actor, or writer rather, author, Terry McMillan, um, published a book, How Stella Got a Groove Back. It became a box office hit through the award-winning actress Angela Bassett Whoopi Goldberg and Tay Diggs as, as Angela Bassett scripted out the role of Stella who was hoaxed by or coaxed by her friend to take a vacation from her busy professional business life and like schedule yes, and having gone to Jamaica she met and fell in love with a native of Jamaica only to discover that what she thought was love was not really love but beloved while that made for a silver screen sensation and a box office hit the educational value of the movie bespeaks the reality of the life of the author Terry McMillan who fell in love with a man much younger than herself yes, sir. but who had to work herself back from a state of depression after having discovered that the man she loved didn't like women yeah. and therefore she was literally Stella herself yes, but before you can become withdrawn and have some misgiving yes, sir. You had to beat back depression. You had to find a way to bounce back from the things that have broken your heart and wounded your spirit and jerk your tears. Your name is Stella. 
and you lost your peace, you lost your joy, you lost your drive, you lost your excitement, you lost your will, you lost your determination to push on, to push up, and to go forward. And you said to yourself, I don't have to go through this anymore. Let me give you a word of encouragement tonight. You can get it all back. You can get your peace of mind back. You can smile again. You can enjoy life the way the Lord wanted you to enjoy it. But you got to put forth the effort to go and get it all back. This passage that I read in your hearing conveys an incident in the life of a young seminary student. He was a young understudy and protege of the prophet Elijah. And who, by the recommendation of some fellow students, wanted to make room for themselves for lodging as they would live and seek the tutelage and mentoring of the prophet. And having desired to build their own lodging, it was recommended that they go near the Jordan River and cut down trees and build a log cabin. And the prophet considered, and the prophet agreed, and one of the students used a borrowed axe. And while he was working on chopping a tree down, the axe head came off. The writer said he cried out. And the prophet, having discovered what happened, helped the young brother to get it all back. But there were some things that, that were essential to his recovery. And if you're going to bounce back tonight, there are some things essential to your recovery. Now it won't happen by having somebody to read your poem. It won't happen by nailing a horseshoe over your doorway. It won't, it won't happen by throwing money in the wishing wells. It won't happen by putting rabbit's feet and bunny tails in your pocket. It won't, it won't happen with good luck charms. But I'm a living witness as one who is a standing trophy that you can make your way back. You can get it all back. But beloved, you've got to distinguish the difference between purpose and preference. Preference can get you in trouble. Preference suggests that one has at their disposal several options for selection. And options can get you evicted from the Garden of Eden if you're not careful. Here are your options. Options can get you uh, on your sun deck and walk out on a sun deck and see soul sisters yeah. taking sun baths yeah. and, and you want them so bad you have the husband killed. It's, it's dangerous to exercise preference yeah. when you don't understand purpose. You're not feeling me. You're, some people are confused today because they aren't they haven't quite come to grips with what purpose really means. It was the celebrated author Rick Warren in his book Purpose Driven Life who said in the introductory, if you want to know the purpose behind any invention, ask the one who made it. And if you want to know what humanity is supposed to be about, if you want to know what humanity is supposed to be about, if you want to know how we're supposed to be behaving and carrying ourselves in life, it behooves us to ask the one who made us. Because some of this stuff that we're doing is not according to his design purpose. Talk to me, somebody. This, this, brother, this brother lost the axe head and he had the option of either using the wood for firewood or he could use the handle to fight with. But he dispensed with the options and decided to exercise the right purpose. You're still not there yet. Here it is, here it is, Dr. Walker, here it is. He lost it near the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River is a murky, muddy, dirty, filthy river. Don't you miss this. 
In other words, he lost it in a dirty place. And generally, what gets us in trouble is that we've been spending too much time You, you can call it Holiday Inn, you can call it Hyatt, you can call it Hilton. A lot of what gets us in trouble is that we've been using our tools in some dirty places. I can't hear too good. And there comes a time when you've got to di differentiate purpose and preference this is supposed to be a government of the people for the people by the people but it is being exploited by law breaking lawmakers and it's working but that's not the purpose for which the Lord established government now children have to go to school now and when teachers ask them what their mother's name and what their father's name is, they now have to say my mama and daddy's name is Kate and Karen or Charles and Chuck. Now the Supreme Court made it into law or condoned it. Now it might be working, but that's not the purpose. We have churches now, they are swelling, they're becoming so large and big until we are calling them mega churches. And pulpits full of pity, pitiful, pitiful, petty, petulant, pulpit, penny hustlers, corn collecting clergy, hitting people in their forehead and blowing their smelly breaths in their faces and knocking them out at the altar and then saying God is doing a new thing. Now, it may be working. But that's not what God made it for. Are y'all listening to me? This brother knew that axes are for cutting trees down. This is going to bless your heart, Dr. Lewis. And I'm going to try to go on to something else. He cried out, but he didn't panic. You know why, Dr. Jackson? It's because he knew before he started that he was already working with faulty equipment. Some people are shocked and amazed at the news that we hear about another politician that's been caught up in a sex capade. But you knew before you went in the voting booth and cast your vote that you were voting for some faulty equipment. Come on, don't, don't put your preacher on a pedestal so high and act as though they are the holiest thing that ever walked the ground. Because every time you step on holy ground and come into God's house and hear the word of God, be ye known, be it known unto you that you're listening to the word of God from some faulty equipment. And I know, I know that we're upset sometimes because our children go astray, but it could be because, our, because of the fact that our children were raised by some faulty equipment. What makes you think you're so good that your child is not subject to some faults and failure? Your child has a faulty mother and a faulty father. And your, and, and, and your children have some faulty parents. And every parent and grandparent up in here, up in here, up in here has some fault. You're sleeping with some faulty equipment. You're wondering why he won't come home at night. You knew before he put all the spit in your mouth. You were kissing up to some faulty equipment. You knew before you walked down the aisle and said, I do, that you were exchanging vows with some faulty equipment. And when you understand what purpose really is, you can go get it back. Do you want to go get it back? 
This crowd is satisfied with the loss. Let me try my left side. You want to go get it back? Well, let me go back. I don't want to leave them out. You want to go get it back? Then you need to seek support from sacred sources. I need to hear somebody shout, I need some help. I know you're big, I know you're bad, I know you're smart, bright, brilliant, brainy, brony. You, you have some precious procurements in your possessions as you worked hard and now you can enjoy the fruit of your labor. You've caressed your cranium within the corridor of some astute college somewhere and you've come away with letters and commons and semicolons listed for a mile behind your name. But there comes a time when you need some help. I know that you're a great taxpayer. You pay your uncle every season and you are a law-abiding citizen. You know how to conduct yourself in the public square, but sometimes you still need a lawyer. I know that you're a hell guru. You are juicing and you are slimming down and you are toning up and you are exercising every day. You're resting well and sleeping right, but there comes a time when you need a doctor. Lord, help me preach in here tonight. I know you're a church-going person. You frequent the pew on Sunday and you have the egregious gall guts and children to occupy the pulpit and declare the word of God from across the sacred desk. But even though you're almost about to sprout your angelic wings, you're still a human and you need God's help. Okay. We, we are so smart. We can take the geological pick and diagnose the bowels of the earth and find gold and diamonds and precious gemstones. We are so clever now, we can take global positioning devices and discern north from south and east from west and get anywhere we want to go just by the touch of a button. Doctors now can take laser and operate on your anatomy without incision. Operate on one cell and never disturb the cell next door to that cell. Yeah, yeah. Medical science now affords women the privilege to see what the baby's gonna be, what gender's gonna be before the baby ever arrives on the human scene. Yeah, yeah. But there comes a time yeah, yeah. when you need some help. Yeah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This, and I'm gonna quit. This, this young, this young student, this young protege, Dr. Lewis, knew that he needed some help, but he also knew where not to go. He knew not to go to the other, other students, because when it cried out, not a one of them, Dr. Rogers, came to the rescue. He knew, he knew that he, that he couldn't rely upon upon the other students. They were in the same, same shape that he was in. And there are some people I don't want to try to help me because they're just as crazy as I am. They, they're just as messed up and mixed up as I am. Some people I don't want to try to help me. Their credit is just as bad as mine. I need some sacred support. Talk to me if you can. Somebody, he knew, he knew that he couldn't go to the House of Congress because he knew that they are too color-coded and race baited to help a brother out. He knew that he couldn't go to the House of Congress because they're too busy revising tax laws to make sure that the poor stays poor and that the rich gets richer and that the rich gets richer on the back of the middle class taxpayer. He knew that he couldn't go to family because sometimes family becomes a part of the problem and he knew not to go to church folk because church folk are some of the noblest folk that ever walked the ground and can't wait to put all your business on Facebook and Instagram. He knew that he couldn't go to the 45th president of the United States because he knew that he was a, he was a, he was a demon in European skin and he, and, and, and with his narcissistic, nefarious, conceited, arrogant, cocky, bellicose, and belligerent, and pugnacious disposition with his own unapologetic self who would never apologize for anything that he has ever said about women and particularly about black people. 
he had the egregious gall guts and children to say that my people are from shithole nations let me get a word to president demon Fannie Lou Hamer came out of that hole Thurgood Marshall came out of that hole Mary McLeod Bethune and Rosa Parks Adam Clayton Powell and came out of that hole my mama came out of that hole my daddy came out of that hole the real question is what part of the pit of hell did you come from who dug him out of the hole I'm gonna quit. I said I'm gonna quit. No, I'm not. Hold your hope. He asked, why can't we get more people from Europe? Yeah. Uh-huh. In the United States. The prophet knew that he couldn't go to the 45th president of the divided states of America. Yeah. Yeah. Because he says he wants more European. He asked, why do we need more Haitians? Yeah. Who ran the Indian onto the reservation? Yeah. Europeans. Who worked us for 246 years and still hadn't paid us? Europeans. Who has this nation as divided as it has ever been? European. Are y'all listening to me? I tell you what it did, Brother Faith. He went to the prophet. Yes, sir. I close. Some people can't help you because they don't have any bit of heaven in their hearts. So I tell you what the young student did. He went to the prophet and said, Master, it was borrowed. Oh, praise his name. He knew that he had to give an account to the owner yeah. of the axe. Yeah. Perhaps I need to remind you, beloved, one day you got to answer to the one who gave you life as to how and what you're doing with the life he gave you. God bless your hearts. Beloved, God be with you. It's been good being here. Lord knows I've got to quit. He went to the prophet and said it was borrowed. Every word you say, every move you make, you must one day give an account for what you've done with the life that God has given you. But when you have and even though you made your mistakes and in some instances you lost what you have been responsible for before you leave here tonight in a state of depression it's still possible for you to get it all back but you're going to have to foster unfailing flashbacks I need to hear the word the people in the house tonight to shout you need a good memory now memory is a definite collection of facts gathered through your senses in other words what you've seen what you've smelled what you've tasted what you heard having come in contact with your body has been lodged in your brain therefore you got some facts about what you've seen what you smelled what you tasted what you heard and what you touched but above that when it comes to God working in your life you have some facts it's a fact that he is a burden bearer it's a fact that he is a heavy load sharer 
and it's a fact that he will save a sin sick soul so whatever it is that you have experienced in life thank God for your memory Oh, praise his name, particularly when it comes to you recovering what you have already lost. Oh, praise his name. Yeah, the prophet said to the young student, where did the axe head go in? And he pointed out the place where the axe head went into the water. And I tell you what the prophet did. The text says he took a piece of wood and threw it in to the water. And the axe head did swim and come to where the wood was. Oh, bless the Lamb of God. Iron went in the water, but wood went to get it. Oh, praise his name. That remind me of how I lived in sin. That remind me of a world lost in sin. We lost our holiness. We lost our righteousness in the garden of Eden. But I tell you what God did. He brought wood into the picture. We lost our holiness in the garden of Eden. But wood came to get us. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. Oh, how I love that old rugged cross. Oh, praise his name. Is it anybody in the house ready to give God praise and glory? Just for the fact that he took a piece of wood to get us out of our sin. Oh, praise his name. He asked the young student, where did the iron go in? He showed the prophet. He threw in a stick and the axe head did swim. He said, reach in and pick it up. The text says he took it. Oh, praise his name. But Elijah, oh, bless the lamb. Elisha was not so concerned about the young man remembering where he lost it as much as he was for him not to forget how he got it back oh praise his name let me say it again he was not so concerned about where he lost it he just didn't want him to forget how he got it all back good evening Sherry Grove God knows it's been good being here with you but I've got to bid you goodbye but before I leave you I need to jog your memory it's all right to remember how sick you were but it's best not to forget who it was that healed you it's all right to remember how much trouble you had but it's best not to forget how you got out of your trouble it's all right yeah to remember how you got over but it's best not to forget who brought you over i got a question for you who was it that rocked you to sleep last night don't you forget it who was it that woke you up this morning who was it that closed you in your right mind who was it that started you on your way nobody yeah. nobody but the lord is there anybody in the house who's got a good memory you cannot forget how the lord brought you you cannot forget how the lord taught you you cannot forget how much chemo you had to take you cannot forget how much radiation you had to endure you cannot forget how he put bread on your table you cannot forget how he dried your tears you cannot forget how he lifted your 
showed. You cannot forget how he made a way out of no way. You cannot forget how he made your enemy your footstool. You cannot forget how he made your demon behave. You cannot forget how he got you over your heel. You cannot forget how he brought you through your valleys. You cannot forget how he held your hand. You cannot forget how he guided your feet. You cannot forget how he put a song in your spirit. You cannot forget how he put a hymn in your heart. Somebody in this house ought to testify right now that when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cried out, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout with me. Somebody ought to praise God with me. Somebody ought to be blessing his name. Some people, when they go to church, they wait on the preacher to hoop and holler. They depend on the choir to sing them out of their seats. They depend on the musician to make them move. They depend on the devotion to get them to move. They depend on some praise and cheerleader to get them up out of their seat and to lift holy hand and to give God praise. But I stop by to tell you, you don't need the preacher and you don't need the choir and you don't need the musician and you don't need a praise team. All you need is a good memory. Look back over your life and see how the Lord brought you all the way. You'll have a flashback. Can you remember how he brought you over? Can you give him praise for how he brought you over? Yeah! Hallelujah! Where are the praises? Where are the praises? I need about four people. I'll make five who's not ashamed to give God praise. There was a day when I was a boy, it did not mind, men didn't mind shouting. There was a day when I saw women throwing hats. There was a day when old ladies would get in the middle of the floor and do their holy dance. But we've gotten too cute. We've gotten too sedated. We've gotten so sanctified. We become so sanctimonious. We've gotten so dressed up. We've gotten a little too much education. We bought too many cars. We've got too many houses. Well, God, my father, if you got that much stuff, if you got that much stuff, if you shouted when you didn't have anything, if you shouted when you didn't have that much, now that you got it, somebody in the house ought to be praying right now. Get on out of your seat. Get on in the house. Get by yourself. You got to have, and I don't care attitude. Tell your neighbor, give me some room. I got to praise him for every blessing. I got to give him glory for every blessing. Shout, thank you, Jesus. I remember I got my joy 